question for you. <laughs> I'm going to start. I understand that there's been a couple plane crashes in, uh, <laughs> in uh, Curry Beach. <laughs> and I understand that you were actually a one. part of, oh, was, was there one or was there two? One? One, I lost it. it Airplane up on Northern Extension. Oh, okay. So I think you rode both of them. Could you tell us a little bit about these crashes that occurred at our beach? That yeah. aren't necessarily written in the Being doomed. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a uh, turtle track and I was going to land. This, this was years before turtles got on the extinct list. I was going to land on the beach and pick up the turtle eggs and go back to the airport and bomb them. <laughs> okay, the wind was out of the southwest. I came in, into the wind. We had 20 or 30 foot dunes up on the north end at that time. Wind came over the dunes, dumped me in the ocean. That was it. <laughs> that was the first one. That's the first one. And the total. The others, <laughs> I walked away and, and rebuilt the engine and blew, blew the airplane out. Okay. But that one went in the ocean. <laughs> I got my feet wet. <laughs> okay. Any questions for our panel? Well, how, why don't I ask a couple of questions? Oh, uh, that's right. And then it might spark some of your creative questions on your own, but. Um, I'm only a two-year resident. My name is Linda, so it's really an honor for me to be standing up here with these lifelong members of Curie Beach. And um, congratulations on the award. Um, really impressive. So you heard about all the children and their vision for 75 years, and I think we're going to be talking a lot about the history, right, the past 75 years. But maybe each of you can share what you think the future Curie Beach looks like from your eyes since you've been here a lifetime. Brenda, why don't you get started? Okay. What is she asking? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, my no, hearing is hear gone. On side. So, what do you think the vision of Curie Beach will be in the next 75 years? <laughs> <laughs> I actually talk about the past better than the future, <laughs> but uh, I imagine there will have to be a an end to the growth at some time. There's no more land. But those of you that are fortunate enough to live here now, enjoy every moment of it. Uh, it is a spectacular place. It was a wonderful place to grow up. Certainly different now, but not in a bad way. We just need to keep the growth controlled. And those of you that live here, enjoy yourself. That's what happened when I grew up here. It was fun. It, it was a spectacular place to be young in. Nice. Thank you, Brenda. Punky, how about for you? What do you think the future looks like for Curie Beach? <clears throat> Wide open. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Personally, uh, I think it's a good, uh, good thing that the uh, federal government took that property back over there for a buffer zone. Otherwise, we'd be swamped. Mm. Although, back on the river shore is some of the most beautiful land that you want to see. High ground, beach, and river. It's beautiful. Yeah, pretty. But it, it's good. And David, how about for you? Yeah, that's a scary thing, right? So, um, one I was thinking about with the third graders in here that I remember being their age playing in this firehouse because this was the firehouse back yeah. when I was their age yeah. um, and that was the town hall. But I think we're very fortunate that people come to Curie Beach because of what we are and some of them want to change it when they first get here. I know you said two years and, and so um, we get to hear how they want to change it and then we try to put them off for four or five years and then they realize after a few years down here, okay, we don't really want to change it that much. And I'm hoping that continues, right? So I'm hoping that, that, that all the people, the new people that come in, relax for four or five years and look around. And then by that time it dies off that, hey, you should do it like where I came from, right? 
And if, if that keeps happening, I think we'll be very fortunate. Um, I agree with Punky. I hope the federal government never turns away that land um, because that is a great buffer for us. And having the limited land, older houses are going to continually get bigger and turn over. I hope that people that buy them and turn them into short-term rentals eventually move down and live in them like happens now. Um, so for a few years, we have to deal with this mini motel near our houses, and then suddenly someone's living there full time, and that becomes really nice, right? So I hope that continues. Um, we're very fortunate in that we are small, we are limited. I think we've got great people that are involved in the town at all levels, right? From the staff that put on all this, to all the volunteers, to the town council to the volunteers on the fire department and all the committees. And I think if people will keep doing that, it's gonna change. It always changes. I, you know, They can tell you more than me, but I can tell you in my 57 years how different it is compared to what I remember. <laughs> but just like Brenda said, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. We just gotta keep making sure that people are involved. And we gotta resist the huge change that someone comes in with a great idea that sounds great, but what people don't realize is all the things kind of interlock together. And if you change one thing dramatically, you don't really understand what it does to everything else. So you gotta be careful. I know people say I'm the, I'm the, the stopper of change sometimes, and I don't mean to be that way, but I do recognize that um, if you make a huge change in such a small place, you don't know how it'll turn out. And you gotta be very careful because going back from that is hard. So I, I think it's gonna be great. I'm hoping I'm the one sitting here in 30 years, maybe not 75 years, I probably won't make it that long, <laughs> but driving up in some cool hover around thing in the center instead of over here on the edge. <laughs> I plan to be here as long as I can though, so you know, yeah, good, good Lord answer. willing. Yeah. Good answer. Did anyone think of a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Just for the no, I don't need that. Just for the panel, we basically on, I live on Davis Road, close to where Dove and Hazel mm -hmm. used to live in the garden, and we had access down to the river from Davis Road back in the day. Yep. And I've heard some stories about that area, driving back through there. And <laughs> can you give me any kind of idea of what used to go on down there? <laughs> <laughs> family environment, yes. Well, I'll let them start. I can tell you what happened in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> Back when it was called Davis Beach, that, all that property belonged to Curie Land and Development. And they came in and set up in there, but they built a little pier on, on the riverside, and Mr. Davis ran charters fishing. And all that, he had several cottages out on the river shore. And they stayed for years and years, and then uh, hurricanes, and first one thing, then another, and then the government bought it. But uh, that was pretty good operation down there. And we have one of the Davises here today, right behind you, Wilbur. Davis. Yes, His family lived on Davis Beach Road. Right. And he could probably answer a lot of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, then from the the narrative well perspective, right? Uh, so, so my grandfather and grandmother and dad spent Hurricane Hazel on those in those houses because. They watched stuff starting to fall into the water and realized they should go to the highlands. So that's where they spent Hurricane Hazel back there. Um, from my perspective, in the 70s, that's where all the kids grew up, right? So if you were lucky enough to, to have a date with a young lady, and my wife's in the back, so we actually got ran off back there from a Curie Beach police officer. Um, that's a lot of what happened back there. And then um, before that, all the roads, that, all the dirt roads and stuff in the Matsu land, back before 9-11, uh, you could go back there. And that's where I learned to drive, actually, in a, a VW Bug my dad had. Um, 
So all my driving was in those woods. That's where I first learned how to drive a stick shift, and that's where I learned how to drive at. So, and then Punky didn't talk about it, but the metal detecting back there until it got shut down, all of the adult men had metal detectors, and in the 70s would go back there and come back with stuff from the Civil War. So metal detecting was, I, I never got into it, I was a little young, but, but Punky and all his buddies and my dad and I think granddad too probably did some metal detecting back there. And so everybody got Civil War stuff because of the battles. Yeah, with a metal detector. Yep, oh yeah. It was fun, Dan and I did that all the time. Yep. It was, I think he used a metal detector and I had to dig. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. He's over there too, my husband. So he will remember what he made me dig up little things out of the dirt. But uh, growing up here was quite an experience, as I know that you will remember too. Oh, yes, ma'am. And with Punky flying the plane and coming to tell his wife to pick him up, he would fly real low and he would, I don't, did you have a bullhorn or something to talk? Just your mouth? <laughs> Big mouth. Okay. And he would say, Jean, come pick me up. So, so we knew Punky was home. Everybody was happy again. <laughs> Low and slow. <laughs> and Incidentally, <laughs> talking about the airplanes, uh, I learned to fly after I got out of service in 47 in Wilmington. 57, I finally got a job flying. Fish spotting. Okay, everybody knows what fish spotting is. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> Guy in the airplane flies around, spots schools of fish, talks to you boats uh, on the radio, directs them up, stops. They've got two boats on the stern called purse boats with a big net between them. They drop overboard. You direct the, the boats up to and then around the place of fish. Simple, as long as you can see the fish. <laughs> that was it, I did that for 20 years, you know, 20 years. Here, here uh, sometimes in Virginia and Louisiana, primarily, uh, down in Louisiana to start with. Who had the most fish? Beg pardon? Who had the most fish? Uh, uh, Virginia. Virginia? Yeah. Hmm. Chesapeake Bay is loaded with Ben Hayden. Yep. There's little fish like that. They're non edible, but they're used in just about everything that you can think of. Uh, the base of paint, the oil is used in paint, lipstick which people don't realize, <laughs> margarine, and just about everything. The fish are ground up and cooked and used as fish meal, and that goes in uh, cattle food, horse food, and that type of supplement, dog food and whatever. It's pretty lucrative business. Wasn't there a Menhaden factory across the river? Yeah. And when one the time, wind blew, you wanted to leave the beach. At, at one Hall. time, there was two factories, one right straight over here and another one just south of it. And then they moved down to Southport and set up operation down there. My cousin, that taught me to fly after the war. He'd been a uh, pilot during the war. And of course, I machine gunner in the Marine Corps. We shot at them. And uh, I went, I promised my, my family if they'd sign up for me to go in at 17. When I, when I came back, not if I came back, but when I came back, I'd go back to school, get my diploma. I did. <laughs> that was a job. <laughs> And then they set up a, a flight school in 47 there at the airport. And my cousin got a job 
as an instructor. He was my instructor. And he was living there at the house with us. So anyhow, that's how I, he got tangled up with, with the man over at Southport. They hadn't been using planes. Nobody knew anything about that. And Hall was the first one on the East Coast to, to fly and spot fish. I rode with him for years in the back seat. Every, t every chance I got, I'd ride with him because I liked flying. I never thought I'd have a job. Uh, so anyhow, job came open and he, I'd already gone through commercial flight. And I had commercial license and all that crap, but no job. Ten years worth of sitting around with no job. I wasn't looking for a job. I was happy doing what I was doing here, piddling. <laughs> so I got the job flying and down in Louisiana, I stayed there I think 11 years and then went to uh, Virginia, bought my own airplane and made more money and all that stuff. Worked six months and the other six months I was out piddling back in there and out here in the ocean and he was chasing me off. <laughs> <laughs> so you ain't supposed to be out on these all these wrecks they belong to the gov uh, to the state. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I didn't worry about that. We had a good time. And I think the world loved you. But anyhow, we were, I was either metal detecting or, or diving and or flying. And that was it. Pure and simple, like me. <laughs> no, you don't need it. No, get out. Come on up. Okay, Brenda, this is for you. A little secret message. Um, <laughs> you, your husband wants me to ask you to share with the group about the height limits of the buildings. About the what? Height, tall, oh. how tall you can go. Oh, yes. I had a, an interview recently uh -huh. with a newspaper, and she asked me what I thought was the most important thing that Cherry Beach had done toward looking after their people and the growth. And my answer was the 35 feet height limit. That was, my father was on, on council then, and he and I had a vivid discussion because I always think I'm right. And he was definitely in favor of the 35 limit, 35 feet. And me being young and not knowing anything, I thought, that's ridiculous. You know, you have, to, you have to grow. Well, after we had our little argument, I thought about it a while. And I am so glad that that has been where it cannot be changed. That has preserved the quality of this beach. It's preserved the oceanfront view for everyone, which it should be. And I told her I was very proud of the town of keeping this in line because there are people that have different opinions about that height. But to me that was one of the most, that was a pivotal decision on this town's part. And it has proved to be a really good one. And when, we, when I meet people that have, have my book and have read it, and there are people all over the country that have bought it, uh, they are impressed with the quality of this beach life, that it is, a, it is still a family beach. It's grown, but it hasn't lost that quality. And that is a thanks to the council and the mayors that we've had in the past, and the ones we have in the future, and the one now. So, and thank you for that. So, and one thing I remember about Pucky's father was when my grandparents and parents had a restaurant, 
there was a little alleyway through there, and he would come in to that alleyway, and I liked to play in there. One day he came, two things happened with him. One day he came in and I was playing with puppies, and I was not happy, and he wanted to know what was the matter. I said, that puppy bit me. He said, what did you do? I said, I bit him back. <laughs> and, but, I didn't bite puppies often. But, uh, and then almost every day he would come through and drop a penny or a nickel, and then he'd stand at the end of this little uh, alleyway and watch me when I went out to find the money. And boy, was I happy. Five cents bought you a nice drink. So, <laughs> but Pucky's father and mother were really, really special as well as David's mother and father. Grandfather, amen. And, you know, yeah, your grand, grandparents. Um, Mom and dad too, I think. So, so I much. Think grand <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, there's so much to uh, remember. And the older you get, the more you rely on your memories. Sometimes they're not, they're kind of faulty. But, uh, and, and writing this book was a book that uh, I had, for 10 years before I ever got up nerve to approach a publisher. And thanks to so many people, mm. you and David and I don't, I can't even begin to imagine how many folks have really helped. But um, the next section of the history is up to somebody in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Back, yeah. okay, perfect. That better. Yep. Uh, Do you recall that? Yeah. When the monument was dedicated, I went down there to it. You could drive. In fact, the road came around the northeast bastion and came in. The colored fishermen had cut a road from straight shot over, over the mounds to go to, uh, to the bay. But the road went all the way around the Northeast Pass and the whole fort was there at that time. That's how much has been eroded. One, Curial Land Development got a big complaint out of the city of Wilmington for hauling rocks from the Lillington to build this road, what they call Dow Road. Curial Land Development put that in, and they frowned, the city of Wilmington frowned on the trucks because they said they were tearing the roads up. In the meantime, some of the engineers had seen all that coquina rock down here. Oh man, we got rock. We don't have to go anywhere. Four of my male relatives at the time, and was still alive. They jumped up and down and said, no, you're gonna ruin everything if you take that rock up. As usual, the government didn't pay a whole lot of attention to you, and they hauled all that rock, and that's the base of the road out here. Well, now you see what happened. We've lost over 300 feet. At one time, our house was right about where that little gazebo is. We live there. Uh, and then we moved to the corner up here on this little house that's facing this way. 1937, Pop sold 40 acres to the government. I mean, uh, to the Dow plant. 
from that curve back to where the plant is. Oh, we were in high cotton, $5,000, 40 acres. They built three houses and furnished them down here on, on the ocean front, or basically ocean front. That was in 38. We moved from this little house down there and everything was plenty of uh, beach. I'd leave from here and walk over to the ocean. There was a, a big pond out there where uh, Atlantic Avenue is now. You had to either go around it or wade waist deep and, and chase the snakes out to get to the ocean. I'd get cold swimming, I'd come back up and sit on the beach close. At that time we had uh, sand dunes. The beach was about 15 feet high here. It dropped down and you went out to the ocean front. The hurricane of 44 took care of most of that. And the hurricanes afterwards, now you see what we've got. We've lost at least three, 400 feet out there, no problem. The ocean eat it. And now we've got to be re-nourished. And they're bringing it up about that high. <laughs> Yo. Since, the, <laughs> since the kids did what they did here today, and I read a lot of those, they're fantastic. I really like it. Uh, I'd like to know about your first three or four years of grammar school and how it was any different then than it is now. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, maybe give me a minute or two. You don't have to. <laughs> One thing I wanted to know is, I knew that your family owned the, uh, owned the schoolhouse over here on the river. I was hoping you might yeah. include that. Yeah, they, uh, they bought, well, Grandma had all that. Curial Land Development had, I think, something like 1,800 acres or, or more. Grandpa bought that while he was up at Carolina Beach. Ocean to the river, Fort Fisher to Hanby Beach, which was the next beach up. It ain't there anymore because we've taken it over. Uh, ocean. But there was there was a lot of a lot of trees back here then. Uh, we had for waterworks and stuff we had a windmill. It pumped water and a little tank on it. For the six, eight, nine houses that was built out here. Four, I think three or four of those were Curie houses. The first one that was built, you had a picture of it, General Bond built it down just a little bit south. And I think one, of, I don't remember which one of the hurricanes, one of the latter ones washed it down. But the, the, the little schoolhouse that uh, burned over on the river by the, by the Newton Cemetery. Did yeah. you go to school there? And uh, if so, how long? Because I knew it burned and then everybody had to go to Carolina Beach. Or... Yeah, that, that was a little bit before my time, but that was. It was, was okay. <laughs> it was there. First grade. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you go to first grade? Me? Yeah. Wilmington. Uh, really? Oh, yeah. I was living in Wilmington. Yeah, I was. All right, here we, go. We, we lived in Wilmington in the wintertime and came down here in the summertime. Mama didn't like the idea of being down here with, with no power, no nothing. We had, uh, the power station was right here. Mm -hmm. had, had a generator. And Crawford Lewis would come up every evening about just before dark, fire up the generator. And that put out the power for eight, six, eight houses that were here. And he was a heck of a nice guy. Scared the out of me one day. <laughs> we were li living over here and I was about so high and went over there, was sitting in the, in the power thing and peeping in, in one of the uh, pipes or something and he was on the other end and he said, whoa, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and needless to say, that scared me. <laughs> but 
he'd come up every day and fire up the generator for the night because CP, not CPNL, but Tide Water at that time said it would cost too much money to run lines down from Carolina Beach to here. So we had our own power, power and water. Pretty simple. We had a power station here for the houses and then it had a generator down on, on the pier, for the pier and the lights for parking at night. Uh, I think there were about 20 watt light bulbs strung out. <laughs> that was about it. I've got a couple of pictures of, of the, the Bear Street. I don't know whether I've got one of those in here or not, but I don't, don't believe so. <laughs> nah. Nope, that's it. <laughs> okay, anybody else have any other questions or any of our town members? That's um, I have a question for David. <laughs> David, when you were, I don't know, between 10, 20, what was this place like? Oh, Cause... so yeah, so that would have been <laughs> the late 70s, early 80s, right? Something like that. Well, I can tell you how much it's changed. So I can remember um, going to the First Baptist Church about 14, so I've been in the late 70s, and in January, and going to church, because um, there was a girl I was chasing after the time. It wasn't my wife, by the way. Um, and, uh, and so we finished church. Church was over. Um, this would have been, you know, the third week in January, 78, 79, something like that. Getting out of church, everyone scatters. Um, walking down to uh, the flashing light, because it was flashing back then in January, on a Sunday, one in the afternoon, by the time we had finished, finished chasing, then there was nothing else to do. Getting in the center of the road on 421 and walking all the way down to Fort Fisher and back in the center lane on the yellow lines and not seeing a single car, a single person <laughs> at one in the afternoon in January. That's, that's how small it was. So... Um, there, in the winter time, in the 70s, there were about maybe 300 people here. There were my brother and I and four other kids our, around our age, right? Four or five other kids total. Um, that, that's who you ran around with because that's all there was, right? This was before I had a car. Um, and I think about that now. I would not get in the center of the road in Curie Beach on a Sunday any day unless we've got it, you know, unless we're closed for a hurricane and we have a curfew and walk. And, and I'm so amazed about that because honestly, the first two rows of houses were almost all vacation. None of us lived on the first row after the hurricanes, right? So everyone lives back. I mean, my whole family's Fifth Street and back, um, all the Heglers are. and the Curies and the Robertsons and the Coffees, if all the people that grew up down here from long ago, no one's on the first two rows, and there's a reason for that. And so back then, in the wintertime, there was no one in those first two rows. I mean, I still, I still am amazed thinking of that, that story because it's hard to believe that you could get in the center lane of 421 and walk... <laughs> at one in the afternoon on a Sunday all the way down. Because I look now on Sundays at the traffic and it's just unbelievable. So, so it was like that. Um, there was nothing to do, no one down here. You know, we were, we were pretty isolated. I mean, when I grew up, I played baseball in Wilmington. And I'm not, I mean, I'm kind of old, but I'm not that old. But there was no baseball on the island. So we went to Wilmington to play baseball in the 70s. Right, um, there was a scout troop, um, but it was mostly Carolina Beach people, right? So me and, and Leslie's son Sam, and and some other kids from Carolina Beach. All of my friends in my grade school um, it was in Carolina Beach. Everything was in Carolina Beach, right? I'd ride my bike up to Carolina Beach. Um, there was there was that was before there was a movie theater when Star Wars came out. Me 
and Sam and Greg Holt and my brother rode our bikes to Longleaf Mall to watch Star Wars. <laughs> so so we, got, we didn't tell our parents either, so Leslie may just be learning this, and Sam may be in trouble, but, but we got on our bikes and we rode all the way to Longleaf Mall to watch Star Wars, because it was the thing, right? And then we rode all the way back, and that tells you how the traffic was all the way to Monkey Junction. Actually, Longleaf Mall is past that, right? It's on the shipyard. Um, but, but yeah, we rode right on the side of the roads all the way up there, watched Star Wars, rode all the way back. Our parents didn't know at the time or we'd have probably been in trouble. So, so that's how it was. What was it like being a lifeguard back then? Uh, it was, yeah, so, yeah, there were no ATVs, there were no radios, there were none of that. So, um, uh, basically, you know, lifeguarding was a great job. You were on the stand, you had a flag. If something happened, you put the flag to red or threw the green one down, and then you went in the water, and sometimes there was nobody else that came, right? So it was you out there with whoever it was, with a buoy and three or four people, and you eventually get them in, and you're all tired, and then you'd look, and like, where's my help, right? There's no help, right? Citizen, people on the beach would help you sometimes, but yeah, when you were a lifeguard back then, there was no radio, no ATV, none of that cool stuff that there is now. Um, so it, it was a great place to grow up, and I'm glad that my kids got to grow up here. Um, I hope some of y'all's kids get to grow up here because uh, it is different from anywhere else, um, and we need to keep it that way, different from anywhere else. Yeah. You got one more? Yeah, just one more. For anybody up there, where can I find tomatoes as good as Doug's garden tomatoes? And what's the story about houses floating down and, oh, I'm going to take that house. I think yeah. Doug's house, or he was talking to me and Jerry. Uh, yeah. Uh, houses yeah. just floating by. So, so the house that my uncle now lives in that he's talking about on Davis Beach Road, if you drive down, the very last house on the right was my grandfather's house. Now it's my uncle's house. Um, when Hurricane Hazel hit, my grandfather and probably Punky sometimes and his partner did whatever you could do. This was the 50s, right? And so one of the things they did was move houses among many other things, right? So Punky talked about sort of messing around back in those days. You did all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that um, my grandfather and his partner did was move houses. So when Hurricane Hazel happened, a lady on Northern Extension contacted my, my grandfather and his partner and said, hey, our, my two houses washed off into the marsh at Northern Extension. And I don't really want to spend any money, but if you'll get this one, the good one, and move it back to where it is, you can have the other one. And so that's how my grandfather got his house. So him and his partner moved the first house back and then they got the second house. Then he had to find somewhere to put it. So I guess he probably called Punky and said, hey, I want to buy a lot, you know, a lot. Um, and and so, so he moved that house to right across from the Lutheran Retreat Center. That's where it sat for most of my youth. And then as the town got bigger and bigger, um, he got kind of aggravated with all the noise on 421. And so I guess I was in college. So probably in, in the early to mid 80s, 84, 85-ish time frame, he decided it needed to be moved again. So they moved it back onto Davis Beach Road where it is now. Um, that's what people don't understand now. A lot of the houses down here have been moved a few times. So the house that Lisa and I live in, part of it, a quarter of it, was, was an old beach cottage that got moved to where I live now on Fifth Street and raised up on pylons and then we moved back and expanded it and expanded it again. I think it's on phase seven or eight now. Um, but the, the front top was a cottage from the 50s. And, uh, you know, Brenda or the, the lady from the Federal Historic Site showed all the barracks homes. That was a very common thing down here. So moving houses around, I don't know how many houses have moved down here, but I'm sure Punky knows a lot of them have like just jumped around especially as property values change, a lot of them moved from the front towards the back, right? Because it's like, okay, you want this lot close to the beach? Yeah, I'll sell that to you. I'll buy another lot, and I'll just pick my house up and move it. And, Cheap lots. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so multiple houses in the town have moved multiple times. Yeah. Um, 
And the first house we had was a barracks, and the land was bought from Lawrence Curie, I think maybe for $200, and the house probably didn't cost much more than that. And they moved two barracks on two lots on 3rd Street, not far from here. And my grandparents lived in one, and my mother and father and I lived in the other one. And lived in that barracks until 1960 when my parents built a new house and tore down the second old barracks. Dan and I moved the barracks that my parents had lived in to three lots that we bought on 5th Street. And we lived in that for, what, nine years, I guess, till we moved into Wilmington. So there are a good number of barracks still left down here. And they survived the storms. Mm -hmm. Our home never had any damage. But uh, we were fortunate. And Speak. Speak. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was told that there used to be a road from the pier on the ocean front down to Davis Road or down to that access. Y'all remember that? Say, say again. There was, I was told that there was a road from somewhere around the pier <laughs> south to, to Davis Road. He's talking about uh, Atlantic Avenue. He's talking no, about no, no. Uh, that's as far as it's gone. Is what you see out there now. It, the road was out a little further. It's in the ocean. Yeah, there was a road there. Yes, sir. There was. The, so Hurricane on, on Hazel. the maps, on the maps, it shows a road. It was never there. It was really? washed away. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. When was it washed away with Hazel, right? Uh, no, it washed away four Hazel. Oh, 44? Yeah. So in the 44? Hazel. Yeah. You're talking about... No road. Yeah. The only road was the highway. That went out and washed away at one point. Yeah, it's been Fort washed. Fisher. Yeah. In fact, we had cottages that was out beyond that road. And they pulled back. They pulled back. Right. Twice. Hazel got four of them. Right. And ended that. So the road has been gone years yeah. prior to Hazel. In fact, I had four, four or five lots that I gave to the state because it was about from here to you. It was out at low tide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And and they wanted me to pay taxes on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's cheaper to give it to the state, let them have it for a walk. <laughs> now it's all underwater. That's right. Yep. Well, we but, are. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Monkey. There was a joke, not, not a joke, but uh, I was sitting over here at the church before we built that one during Hazel and my father-in-law came up and he said I, I want if you want to see something funny come on up to the bridge and I said what is it he said well, it was the house in the waterway I said okay it was blowing didn't have anything better to do <laughs> jumped the car around up there with him there's a big old two-story house tide was falling the wind was blowing that way. Big two-story house, doop, doop, doing this. Fully furnished, everything in it. And the, the uh, bridge keepers, at that time we had a swing bridge. They were out there with a big key trying to open the bridge so the house could go through. <laughs> it goes through, stops out there at the river. Tide changes. They had to do the same thing. It went back, <laughs> went, up, went up in the marsh, and stayed there for several years until it just melted, fell down. Every piece of furniture in that thing, intact. Wow. It looked like you could walk in, sit down, mm -hmm. and it go bobbing down the road and, and <laughs> buy it back. Wow. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Go ahead. 
What about the, the story, the legend of the German submarine? Okay. Yeah. Fire yeah. on the bromine plant. I've heard that happened. I've heard that's made up. No. No, no, no. You're looking at one that saw one. Okay. I was coming home from school. That was before we moved back to Wilmington on the bus. The bus stopped. They had uh, 455 millimeter cannon up there guarding the Dow. And we had to stop. The guys were running across the road to get to the guns. The first one got lined up and fired. I couldn't see what they were shooting at because we had sand dunes then. Came on down, got off the bus out here at the intersection. I live right down on the corner. Ran down to the pier. All I could see was a white water. It was five, six miles up further offshore. Boom, boom, boom. About that time, here comes the planes out of Wilmington. Machine gunning it. Here comes some more bombing it. Okay, it went on until, this was about 4.30, 5 o'clock. Well, it gets dark, you know, down here, or used to, for daylight starvation time. And <laughs> so we went on out. I sat there until it got dark, but they were still bombing and, and banging and all that stuff. Well, about nothing ever was said about it. This, this was during the war. Uh, later on, about uh, probably about 20 years ago, I was looking up some wrecks, or probably a little longer than that. Lo and behold, there's a German submarine sunk right out there in about 600 feet of water. Same date, same time. Must have been the same ship that I saw. Now, prior to that, there was supposed to be one that fired into the fort, I mean, into the uh, dial plant. Shells going over it and into the river. But this, this other one was uh, at night. I was a messenger with the Civil Defense, and that was in the dark, and it was, everything was shut down. But now, I didn't hear any gunshots or anything like that. I don't know. But I do know what I saw. I do know that there was one that was shot at and sunk. Because I personally saw that dude. Can we all please give our three panelists a round of applause for amazing stories? Okay. Good job. Bean time. I know. There you go.